Um, thanks, Graham, for that uh, introduction. Yeah, um, as a fund manager, Graham was one of the biggest pains in the asses to go and visit, <laughs> because being a chemical engineer and with a, and we've got a chemical processing plant, um, Graham knew more about it than I did, and uh, and he often made me feel like that too. So. <laughs> But I hope your investment was uh, worthwhile at the time. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time today, and thanks for coming out to, uh, to hear us. Um, I'm, as you've heard, Gavin Lockyer, Managing Director of Arafura Resources, uh, Arafura Rare Earths now. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about our Nolans project, which is developing a rare earth project uh, north of Alice Springs. The criticality of our um, project lies in the fact that it's enriched in NDPR, or neodymium, praseodymium, which are two key um, elements that go into high performance magnets, which feed into renewable energies and also electric vehicles, other pr primary, um, primary uses. Other uses include uh, in MRIs, uh, robotics, and also um, uh, a lot into now refrigeration. The NDPR, um, despite Graham, I'd hate to um, contradict you, but if you do have a car that's over 10 or 15 years old, they will have some rare earth magnets in there because you'll probably still have electric, you'll have uh, windscreen wipers, you'll have uh, electric seats or um, electric mirrors, electric braking, all of those have a little uh, micro motor in them which all contain rare earths. So even though a vehicle maker, such as we heard Tesla uh, last year, comment that they were going to engineer out rare earth magnets, they will still use rare earth magnets in every other application, even if they use the old Tesla technology in the motor. The deposit itself, um, I haven't looked at this statement for a long time because we've moved so much further now, but uh, I thought being a mining club um, uh, presentation, you might be interested in the, uh, in the resource statement. It's open at depth. We've drilled over 90 kilometres of holes into this deposit, lots of it at 20 by 20 spacing. And we know that it, uh, this resource statement gives us 38 years life of mine, and that's just in vertical depth, 200 metres. We've drilled 400 metres deep and still been in mineralisation. So it's an extremely big deposit. Um, and we're also blessed that it, uh, it's a, a fluorapatite, so it's hosted in a phosphate ore and we extract the phosphate as well as a, uh, as a byproduct to the, um, to the rare earths. From that statement, you can see that we're actually probably a phosphate resource with a rare earth byproduct, but in terms of revenue, the rare earths represent, or the ND, NDPR represents about 85% of our revenues. The location, 135 kilometres north of Alice Springs, um, if you want to mine uh, somewhere uh, that typically people think are remote, this isn't remote. It's in an absolutely ideal location. Only 130 k's north of Alice, straight up the Stewart Highway, 10 kilometres inland to the west. We, um, you can see on, that, uh, on, the, on the box to the bottom left, uh, the red line there represents the Amadeus gas pipeline, which runs straight through our tenements. Uh, and we'll be tapping in for, uh, for power through the, through the gas pipeline. That pipeline takes and has surplus gas. It takes gas from the Amadeus Basin in the south up to Darwin, and it's recently been connected across the East Coast grid. The uh, railway line, obviously, Alice Springs, a uh, great logistics um, hub, so we'll be able to uh, bring materials in and out of, of Alice Springs and, and truck it up to site relatively easily. And back in 2013, we um, embarked on a significant uh, water drilling exploration uh, program. Obviously, Central Australia, water is an extremely important asset. And, um, and obviously, for a mining and processing operation, we require a fair, fair, fair amount of water. So we uh, undertook a, a program. It cost us about $13 million. And we identified a significant new water resource that nobody in Australia had ever discovered before. All the local, including the indigenous groups out there, said there's nothing there. It's sickness country. It's, it's just spin effect scrub. And we drilled 12 holes, and every one of them was wet. Uh, some of them were even just uh, as, as shallow as 10 metres below. So uh, significant water resource, and that's represented on that chart by those green... Uh, green dots and green lines, it's about 20 kilometres to the south of the project. 
Uh, this was a picture taken earlier this year. As Graham mentioned, uh, we, we undertook a significant cap raising at the end of last year and um, had enough confidence to start construction. The view was to uh, build the uh, construction camp uh, and, and the water uh, pipeline as well as access roads so that we could be ready when the market is ready for the uh, to get the project financing done. Uh, that we would go straight into construction. So that's a, um, a shot as of a couple of weeks ago. 200-person uh, camp, uh, fully serviced by ESS out of um, Alice Springs. Unlike a lot of uh, other rare earth projects, we're actually going all the way through to ox an oxide. For those of you that would be familiar with Linus, uh, they currently mine and beneficiate in Western Australia. They then export that beneficiated material to Malaysia and uh, produce a rare earth oxide, a separated NDPR product. We're doing the same, but we're doing it all at a single site. And this has been really well received by particularly our, uh, our off takers because uh, there is some radioactivity associated with these deposits. And by leaving all our mining waste at the site from where they came from, not moving it across jurisdictions is seen as a really, uh, a really positive thing, particularly when the product we're producing ultimately goes into green, clean energy technologies. Um, the the customer would like to. The customer is expecting high standards of ESG. We uh, have all our uh, NT and federal government approvals in place, including the Indigenous Land Use Agreement, and uh, and our mining licences are all granted. So when the funding is available, we're ready to go. This is the, the flow sheet that Graham is very familiar with and uh, often grilled me on. I won't uh, bore you to tears with it. I'm not a chemical engineer. But basically, uh, the front end of it is uh, mining, which is um, just grinding and flotation. That represents about 10% to 15% of our capex and opex. All the heavy lifting is done post-flotation. We have a phosphate circuit at the front end, which extracts the phosphate and cleans up the rare earth stream. The rare earth stream then goes into a traditional rare earth baking process. However, unlike other rare earth um, producers such as Linus and, and the Chinese, uh, because we're cleaning up the, uh, the rare earths before they go into the acid bake, we're able to do that at much lower temperatures. Uh, I think Linus cracked theirs at about 850 degrees Celsius in some very big 80 metre kilns. Uh, we can do ours at 200 degrees Celsius in just some big paddle mixes, a bit like a big mix master that you make a cake in. So much, uh, much uh, simpler process and hopefully uh, when we go to commission then uh, we'll have a, a few less headaches um, along the way. The, uh, that flow sheet has been extensively piloted at scale. Um, we've done, completed that work back in 2018 and uh, that was uh, the, the feed into our feasibility study, which was um, uh, published in uh, February 2019. The HydroMet plant, if a uh, couple of tens of millions of dollars of engineering gets you some pretty pictures, um, you can uh, go onto our website where this presentation will be lodged. And if you scan that QR code, you actually get a quite detailed fly through of the HydroMet plant. Um, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a fairly significant uh, building, and as I said, that's that's probably about 60, 70 percent of our operating cost and our capital cost. The key for us is around the funding at the moment. Uh, all our focus is on that. Uh, the, as I said, the engineering, the metallurgy, the geology has all been uh, locked away. The project economics were put out in. Um, uh, February uh, 2019, as I said, with a DFS. Following uh, the uh, issues in the Ukraine and obviously all the issues in labour and, uh, and other supply um, trends that the world was experiencing, we, we put a project update out in November 22, so about a year ago. Uh, we took a 40% hit in CapEx at that time. We think we've uh, captured the majority of the, uh, of the, uh, of the inputs and um, Hopefully we don't have any nasty surprises. We've been uh, undertaking a detailed engineering uh, process with Hatch. We've also had uh, Monodelphus, a constructor, uh, working with us as an early uh, contractor. And uh, at, at this point in time, uh, I'm pleased to say there's no nasty surprises in, in CapEx or OpEx. 
uh, that um, we wouldn't expect. So uh, I won't go into the economics, you can read them yourselves and uh, as I said this has been, this is a little bit dated now and we'll be looking to update this uh, for our lenders in, uh, in coming months. The funding structure is relatively complex. Um, we have always targeted offtakes in those jurisdictions where NDPR is considered strategic to industry, i.e. auto industry and the uh, wind turbine industry and also those jurisdictions which have strong ECA um, backing or export credit agencies. Uh, to that end, uh, we've appointed uh, SOCGEN and KFW, the German bank, uh, as our lead arrangers for the debt. KFW and has also been appointed the export credit agency lead bank, um, and I'll talk about the different um, banks that are involved in this and, and why it's so difficult to bring them all together. Um, <clears throat> Through our offtake uh, arrangement with GE, uh, they have a line of credit with uh, Export Development Canada, which is the Canadian bank. Uh, they've uh, given us a, a 300 US million dollar facility. Uh, we won't use all these facilities, by the way. This is just up to, um, depending on where the final debt stack um, sits and how much, how much offtake ends up going into each jurisdiction. Similarly, Erla Hermes through uh, with KFW, uh, the German side of things, we've got a uh, offtake arrangement with Siemens Gamesa, uh, which is a, a wind turbine manufacturer in uh, in Europe, uh, and that facility is for up to 600 million US dollars as well in lending. We're working with the Australian government, as uh, Graham alluded to. The Critical Minerals Facilitation Office uh, was established a few years ago, and myself and Rowena, who you'll hear from a bit later on, have been working closely with the Australian government and trying to. Um, Get, get their heads around their strategy. They make grand statements around um, wanting to diversify supply chains and we must have a critical minerals um, supply chain ex China. Um, but when it comes from what government wants and actually their agencies to facilitate, it's, uh, it's a big step. And so we've been working for many years now with Export Finance Australia, EFA, and NAIF, the Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund, to educate them on critical minerals and I'm pleased to say that uh, we've received significant support, um, as you can see on the dot points there, uh, from funding from both EFA and NAIF. And they are now starting to lead these types of transactions offshore because Australia is well endowed with minerals, as everybody in this uh, audience would know, um, but we often lack the capital in order to extract those minerals. However, offshore has strategic industries that require these minerals and they also have large, uh, large, uh, large pockets. So it's about trying to bring, and this is what the Australian government's been working with us and others on, bringing together industries from both sides of, of um, both, both uh, sides of the uh, of politics and also of countries, trying to diversify these supply chains. COVID was the uh, classic example, where um, a tiny little. Um, both the microchips and the and the rare earth magnets represent about one percent of the cost of an electric vehicle. Without it, you don't have an electric car. And what Volkswagen discovered through COVID, when the Chinese magnet manufacturers shut down due to COVID, um, and yet COVID hadn't really hit Europe, they couldn't produce their cars. There was about sixty thousand vehicles sitting in a paddock in Wolfsburg in Germany that they couldn't sell because they couldn't get microchips or rare earth magnets. I have a, a friend back in Perth that uh, actually ordered a, a, a BMW during this time. The BMW was delivered and it doesn't have electric seats because they couldn't get the magnets. Um, so COVID was just really something that was highlighting something that was always there, that China controls this market and the rest of the world has not been doing enough to develop it. And that's where projects like ours and also Rowena's that you'll hear about um, a bit later on uh, are extremely important to get that up and running and to make sure that uh, we are feeding into uh, a massive um, growing demand. Everybody is demanding electric vehicles or electrification of, of transportation fleets, but also renewable energy and that's uh, the, the offshore wind turbines. Just finally, this is my last slide. Um, I've, I've mentioned some of our offtakes and this is where we're currently selling. Uh, the lenders have indicated they would like about 85% of our product 
tied up with offtake. Uh, we're currently sitting at about 53%. Uh, uh, we have a non-binding agreement still with uh, GE at the moment, which we hope will turn into a binding agreement shortly. That will take us up to about 63% of our 85 that we need for the financiers. And as I said before, we're, we're looking to diversify our offtake or our sales contracts into those jurisdictions that provide us uh, both with a diversity in geographical locations, diversity in lending, um, lending opportunities, uh, but also uh, diversity from, uh, in terms of uh, credit risk from individual customers. We're in uh, very strong um, and uh, lengthy and um, advanced discussions with a number of other groups in Japan and Europe and the US, uh, and hopefully in the next uh, six months uh, we can make some great announcements about all of that. So. Uh, all in all, uh, as, as Graham said, I, I should just touch on the equity side of things as well. Um, our, our plan is to uh, get this offtake locked away, get the debt stack locked away, and then we can clearly identify how much equity we need to raise. We are working with uh, most of the offtakers as well for strategic equity input, um, which we've announced. Uh, uh, we announced a non-binding arrangement with Hyundai, which we're working through. There's also non-binding arrangements going on with other groups who will all be household names, which I hope we can uh, announce uh, by first quarter next year. And uh, as, uh, as Graham alluded to, uh, Mrs. Reinhardt uh, graciously injected 10, uh, funds up to 10% of our equity uh, last year. And we would hope that um, once the debt stack's locked away, we can bring in some strategics in, in the likes of Hyundai and others alongside Hancock which reduces the volume of, um, of, of equity that we need to go out and raise in the, in the market. We'll be looking for somewhere in the order of about our market cap, so you can um, understand the, the challenge that, we, uh, that we're facing. Anyway, thank you for your time. Um, I've got, uh, I believe, time for Q&A uh, in a little while. So, um, and, and I should mention, as Graham mentioned, our chairman, uh, Mark Southey, is here. Um, our uh, Head of External Communications in David Grabau is also here, and uh, one of our other non-executive directors, Chris Tonkin, is also here. So please, if, if you want to ask us questions afterwards, um, feel free to grab one of us along the way. Thank you all.